Good day and welcome. Uh, I'm Moira Patterson from the IEEE Standards Association, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our um, kickoff session today of the IEEE Metaverse Congress webinar series uh, that the IEEE Standards Association is organizing uh, under the foundational technologies practice. Welcome to all our attendees. Before we get started, just a few quick announcements. Uh, due to our very full uh, agenda today, we are uh, having the attendees uh, muted in today's session. However, we hope that in the, the uh, panel sessions later on that we will have time for audience questions. Uh, so as we get down to those items, please do use uh, the Q&A function uh, that you see uh, on the bottom of your screen uh, to submit questions at that time. Um, I also want to just notify everyone that today's session is being recorded and we will make it available uh, afterwards uh, so that folks can also uh, view it again. Um, so with that, uh, we want to kick off the exciting session today. And we have a welcome message from uh, Eva Kaili, the Vice President of the European uh, Parliament. Yes, it is a pleasure for me to be among you today and discuss a topic of great importance as it is a new reality that could lead to a transformation of all sectors of our lives. Today our ways of escaping reality, they have become much more sophisticated. Um, to an extent where living in the physical world has become just one of our options. So while the metaverse is still difficult to define, I could say it's a universe beyond the physical uh, world, a virtual world, which can revolutionize the digital economy and provide a constantly expanding immersive 3D world where people can interact with each other and they can carry out everyday activities in a different manner. The metaverse is still at an infant stage, more like a, a gaming experience, with avatars that can interact, even play online, but that should not prohibit us from being proactive as the pandemic accelerated the adoption of such technologies to provide solutions. We need to start thinking about how we want the technology to work for us, to complement us, and how to translate our privacy and security safeguards from the offline world also to the online. Studies expect that by 2026, 25% of citizens will be able to spend at least one hour per day on the metaverse, while it is projected that the economic impact can reach 5 trillion euros by 2030. In the end, technology is not good or bad. It is about how we use it, how we harness it, and how we can integrate safety and privacy standards by design to achieve the benefits of such technologies. The metaverse might be able to advance our society in many ways. However, the risks is my job also to ensure that if they are posed to our citizens, um, they're important tasks for us to tackle. One of the most prominent examples of the metaverse innovation and application uh, is Education, it can transform how people learn in different fields. In healthcare education, we can use Metaverse to have uh, medical students being trained and having an experience of remote surgeries. In the field of psychiatry, it can be used by practitioners for virtual therapy and it can indeed help patients overcome conditions such as agoraphobia by exposing them in controlled virtual environments. Private companies are already working to revolutionize this uh, workspace with, uh, within the metaverse. Uh, they can even build virtual offices where you can eventually provide an accurate alternative to the physical one. Um, there is an experience that maybe all of you have that is similar, traveling in 3D like the Google Earth and visiting museums or places that you cannot visit otherwise. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a catalyst for the digital transformation and we learned a lot of lessons from this pandemic. Remote work and digital events, they are rapidly being tested also now in the metaverse in case we have to face a similar challenge. So aside from the large tech companies that build and experiment on the metaverse, 
this space is now attractive to gaming companies and also brands that are globally known, like Nike, Adidas, Ralph Lauren, even Hermes. They see opportunities in their digital products to attract a younger audience and achieve more sales, even if this means in digital form, so you don't even need to order something offline, but you can use it for your avatar, you can use it for your digital presence. While the innovations um, should not be understated, uh, it is crucial for us to enter in a debate on how we can contribute to build an open, fair and safe metaverse. Our key priority is the protection of the rights and the freedoms, since we actually experience um, challenges online. Even though we still do not know or can predict how uh, it's going to materialize in the future, we expect that our participation will include a huge collection of massive amounts of data, including personal data, biometric data and physiological responses, our gait. So the depth of information that companies can track in real time, like facial expressions, vocal inflections and other vital signs of users, could enable them to gain a deeper understanding of users and the behavior we have that can be used to tailor our advertising in a very targeted manner. We need to ensure that we are still in control of our data as um, users need also to be able to move inside different metaverses, different, different lands on the metaverse. This means we need to force and, and think solutions for problems of cybersecurity, uh, when you have data portability, interoperability in the ecosystems and also how we can safely share data. Our policies need to adjust to this ever-changing reality and also to the questions that are raised. Who is collecting those? How can we ensure that we understand the liabilities and that it's not involuntary and uh, that we are not constantly being subjected to subliminal advertisements and intrusive profiling, how we can ensure that our children are not exposed to harmful content and behaviors, that an adult cannot communicate with our child in the metaverse without our permission. These are important questions that we need to start providing answers to because it's a technology of the future, but it's already here and we need to act in the present. There are already cases in the metaverse where users have been subjected to harassment, women were sexually attacked and children experienced uh, a form of cyberbullying. Thankfully, the EU innovations in the uh, legislation like the DSA, Digital Services Act and the AI Act, they have already provided a framework that can safeguard us, but it's crucial to adjust it also for the metaverse with further actions to protect children online. At the moment, Big tech companies are in a race to control and shape the metaverse environment. They are using even harmful practices to increase their market power through killer acquisitions and mergers. In the US, the Federal Trade Commission and a group of US states, they are expected to investigate whether the uh, Oculus uh, App Store may be discriminating against third party applications that compete with the parent company's uh, own applications. So competition regulators in the US and the EU too will need to adjust enforcement practices to confront these new models of commerce and economy that emerge in an entirely virtual domain. The metaverse and antitrust enforcement create a paradigm shift in how competition policy for the digital economy should be approached. These are challenges and uh, basically questions that regulators are asking themselves and they are building a regulatory framework to enable the emergence of a metaverse with mainly opportunities and controlled risks. I hope these questions serve also as a good basis for the discussion today. IEEE plays a great role into introducing uh, in a technical also manner the quality standards that we need and that go beyond the European borders in order to be able to collaborate and get all the benefits of such a technology. I want to thank you for your attention and, and the invitation. I would like to thank Eva Kaili for providing uh, this thought-provoking um, opening remarks. And uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Yu Yuan, the president-elect of the IEEE Standards Association, to share um, his view of the metaverse landscape and outlook. Yu Yuan. Thank you. 
And I'd like to uh, thank again uh, for Eva's uh, visionary opening remarks. It's uh, certainly our great honor to have her kick off our uh, IEEE Metaverse uh, Congress. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, Metaverse landscape and outlook uh, in the next 20 minutes, I hope. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, put a disclaimer that uh, the opinions uh, uh, here are just my opinions, not necessarily the opinions of IEEE or IEEE SA, because I'm going to uh, tell you something that's probably would be controversial. Uh, so first of all, we all know the metaverse uh, is now a very uh, hot buzzword. Uh, brief history uh, includes uh, several uh, major events. First of all, this uh, keyword, this term, was coined by Neil Stephenson uh, in his book, uh, Snow Crash, back in 1992. And then we have Second Life, released in uh, 2003. Uh, which is recognized as the first embodiment of the concept of metaverse. And then we have Roblox, uh, uh, they went to IPO uh, in March, uh, next, uh, oh, sorry, last year, 2021. And uh, <coughs> it also identified the several uh, features of the metaverse in uh, their prospectus. And lastly, uh, Last October, uh, the company Facebook renamed itself to Meta, so it, uh, it actually uh, added to the, uh, I would say, the, uh, the, the, the discussions and the trends uh, about uh, uh, making the Metaverse a, a mega trend. So, but uh, with that being said, uh, many people are talking about uh, different definitions of the Metaverse. And uh, so let's uh, take a look at the origin of this uh, term. Uh, actually, uh, last month, uh, the author of the book, Snow Crash, Snow, Neil Stephenson, uh, in uh, uh, his tweet, he said, uh, in my book, it's all VR. So this is sort of the origin of the term metaverse. But uh, in order to uh, be comprehensive enough, uh, to accommodate the uh, advances uh, in advancement in uh, the uh, last uh, three decades. Uh, I put together a definition uh, uh, which is uh, shared on my screen. So it's basically about uh, uh, metaverse uh, refer to a kind of experiences uh, in which the outside world is perceived by the users as being a universe. <clears throat> so why we are talking about uh, uh, perception? Uh, because uh, to be is to be perceived, we know about that. Even our current universe or our current world, uh, you can say that it is based on your perception. So my definition is based on the perception, the outside world is perceived uh, as a universe. Um, and in addition, uh, there are actually three different types of metaverse. Uh, either it could be a different universe, we call that a virtual reality, or it could be a dig digital uh, extension of our current universe, we call that augmented reality or mixed reality. Or it could be a digital counterpart of our current universe, we call that digital twin. <coughs> uh, but talking about the metaverse, uh, there are many features. Uh, people actually uh, have been adding different tags uh, onto the, the concept of metaverse. So uh, here, here are the uh, features I selected. Named after the universe, a metaverse shall be persistent. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is the most important uh, difference between virtual reality and the metaverse. Of uh, course, uh, uh, named after the, uh, the universe, the uh, metaverse has to be something persistent. Otherwise, uh, the uh, uh, objects uh, or contents created by uh, users in the metaverse will not uh, uh, be lasting and then will not have any uh, consequences or meaningful values. So persistent is the only uh, necessary future uh, feature for the metaverse. <clears throat> and then we, we could say that the metaverse should be massive, comprehensive, uh, immersive, and self-consistent. Talking about self-consistent, because we are talking about a universe, no matter it's a real universe or a digital universe, it has to be self-consistent in terms of uh, all the objects uh, uh, within that universe uh, will uh, interact with each other. 
uh, complying with uh, physical laws uh, and uh, are not driven by anything outside of the universe. That's what we call self-consistent. Uh, but you can see uh, in my picture, there's a line between internal and external. So that's something people typically confuse. Uh, so when we are talking about the features of a metaverse, uh, we should distinguish uh, what are the features uh, that a user could uh, perceive internally uh, within the metaverse and what are the external features, which means the infrastructures, the systems, the uh, you know software, hardware, supporting or enabling the metaverse. So uh, we have ultra realistic as another internal feature of the uh, metaverse and we have accessible and pervasive as external uh, features of the uh, metaverse. Uh, lastly, we say that the metaverse may be decentralized. That is because in my opinion, metaverse does not ha necessarily have to be uh, decentralized, but it could be. So uh, I put it, uh, decentralized uh, uh, right on the line because it could be um, as an internal feature, uh, we can have decentralized applications, scenarios within a metaverse. And also it could refer to the decentralized infrastructure that uh, supports a, a particular metaverse. So uh, in a narrow sense, because uh, I have been working in the virtual reality area for, for many years. So in a narrow sense, uh, I would say that the metaverse is simply persistent virtual reality uh, based on uh, persistent virtual worlds. We can have virtual senses and actions, and we may have virtual assets. Collectively, this, this is a persistent virtual reality, uh, which is indeed the narrow sense uh, metaverse. <clears throat> but in the broad sense, metaverse is an advanced stage and a long-term vision of digital transformation. Uh, because uh, as we can say, uh, uh, almost all the vertical industries are uh, currently under their own digital transformation. So we can imagine and we can expect that there will be a, a convergence stage after uh, the mature level of the digital transformation in every industry uh, get, uh, gets to a, a relatively higher level. So let's talk about what is not the metaverse, especially the concepts that are currently labeled as the metaverse, but are not necessarily, uh, not actually the metaverse. Metaverse, first of all, NFT is not the metaverse. Why? Uh, today, most NFTs have no use value, but only the so-called collection value or investment value. So uh, I, here I put an um, uh, assumption that the mainstream demand of mankind for the metaverse will never be collection and investment, because today, uh, collection and investment are just a, a small piece of our real life. So uh, I would expect that it will be the same in the metaverse in the future. So uh, from that perspective, NFT will not never be the metaverse uh, or the main part of the metaverse. I, I should also say that NFT is not a necessary element of the metaverse. Uh, first of all, well, we should think about uh, the uh, so-called play for fun versus play to earn. Many people wanted to uh, use the number of play for fun users uh, to prove the bright future uh, of uh, the play to earn scenario, but that is not true. These are two very different group of users. Uh, people like me uh, play for fun every day, we don't play to earn. And the second, <laughs> virtual economy does not have to be built on NFT. Uh, we can say those early examples, those early embodiment of the Metaverse like Second Life and Roblox. And lastly, metaverses can be NFT free uh, without an F NFT. Examples include the industrial metaverses, basically those are digital, digital team, augmented reality and the virtual reality for enterprise. And also we can have consumer metaverses purely for fun. And we can, we can also have consumer metaverses for just a different lives. Uh, life is elsewhere, you know, so that's uh, I think uh, the basically the fundamental demand for people to uh, want to read a novel, watch a movie, and also live in a second life. Then let's talk about the Web3. Web3 is neither the metaverse uh, nor a necessary element of, of the metaverse. For these reasons, uh, a metaverse may be decentralized in terms of infrastructure or scenarios, but it does not have to be. 
and uh, we know uh, from technical and uh, business perspective, centralized metaverses can do better than decentralized ones. And uh, Web3 advocates typically talk about ownership, but what really matters to users is use and service, not ownership. Especially if we think about a uh, uh, recent propaganda, uh, when we are telling people that uh, they do not need to own their own house or car in the era of sharing economy, why should everyone own a portion of the metaverse? So uh, that's ridiculous. And I also wanted to add that Web3 itself may not have a bright future at all. First of all, Web3 is not Web3.0. That, that is a game of the, you know, the language. The term Web3 was coined by the Ethernet co-founder in 2014, referring to a decentralized online ecosystem based on blockchain. And second, we know that Web is not internet. Every uh, computer science or WE student knows about that. So you don't want to confuse Web with the internet because they are two different things. And second, uh, third, uh, uh, Web is no longer the mainstream way to access the internet. We firstly we had a uh, web, then we, we now we have apps. So what's the next? But uh, the trend you can say that web is no longer the mainstream way. And also don't get too excited about the so-called revolution. It says that web 1.0 is about read only, and the web 2.0 is about read and write, and the 3.0 is about read, write, and own. That is a fake history. Uh, that is a history invented by Web3 advocates. The internet was never read-only. If you say internet was read-only at the beginning, uh, have you heard of BBS? So lastly, uh, we have new concepts. Web5 and Web6 are coming. So I'm not talking too much about this, but it's just my opinion that Web3 itself may not have a bright future at all. Not to mention that it wanted to uh, claim itself as a, a core element of the metaverse. That is, that, that is not true. So uh, here I'd like to uh, share with you my uh, uh, metaverse uh, landscape, uh, uh, technology landscape. So I, I don't want to put those supportive technologies as metaverse technologies such as computation, storage, communications, data, and intelligence. Those are very fundamental technologies. Uh, their advancement uh, could uh, uh, bring uh, benefits to many other technologies and applications uh, above. So we don't necessarily call them metaverse technologies. Otherwise, we should uh, uh, we are uh, indeed uh, saying that uh, all the ICT technologies are metaverse uh, technologies. That would not make much sense. And uh, <clears throat> so the core techno technologies, uh, I put the three categories. Uh, from left to right. First one is uh, senses and actions, uh, include uh, uh, virtual senses uh, actions and the real senses and actions. And the second one is how to create a persistent virtual world. I call that persistent computing. You can say that we, we have uh, technologies addressing different engines, physics, uh, graphics, and the sounds, and the different technologies to create, a, to generate content, like a professional generated content, user-generated content, uh, AI-aided professional-generated content, et cetera. And uh, then we can support a virtual map, virtual things, virtual objects, and the virtual uh, characters. So the, on the right, I put the digital finance and, and the economy, uh, which are actually optional, but may be helpful. Uh, we have digital assets, which include the virtual assets and uh, uh, other digital assets, such as IP. Uh, which may or may not be built upon decentralization, and uh, the decentralization may or may not be built upon blockchain. So that's my view of the metaverse technology landscape. So with, uh, let's also talk about some uh, uh, technology outlook, especially grand challenges. So in my opinion, I, uh, we have two, at least two grand challenges. One is about the virtual sense and actions. Uh, think about uh, you drink beer with uh, your friend. If we want to uh, simulate this uh, uh, scenario in a virtual world, how to achieve uh, com comprehensive and actual realistic virtual sense and actions. Uh, even we can simulate virtual look, smell, and the taste of the beer, uh, we are still uh, uh, far from uh, being able to simulate uh, virtual dopamine. So 
uh, we are still far from being able to uh, do something uh, simulating uh, that your brain or your consciousness will get high after you drink real alcohol. So that's the first uh, grand challenge. And the second grand challenge is about the virtual worlds, uh, how to build a large scale, fine grained persistent and physically self-consistent virtual world. For example, well, uh, let's talk about a lake in a virtual world. Uh, it can not only uh, glint like water, but also uh, allows you to uh, uh, like boating on the lake, jumping into it for swimming, or wash your virtual avatar uh, with a handful of, a handful of virtual water. Uh, uh, to do so, uh, every virtual water a particle need to conform to physical laws in that virtual world. So that's another grand challenge. So uh, this is my own prediction uh, to uh, solve the first challenge. Uh, we need brain machine interface uh, ad uh, advancement. So I would expect that for, so for today, we have only read only uh, brain machine interface supporting simple actions. But I would expect that, that uh, by 2025, uh, our read-only brain machine interface can support all the actions, which means you can just, uh, by thinking, you can control your avatar uh, uh, very easily without using any particular uh, uh, user uh, interface devices. And uh, um, uh, by 2035 uh, or earlier, uh, our read and write uh, brain machine interface should be able to simulate all kinds of senses that you can perceive from a real universe. So that would be something like the, uh, you know, the ultimate uh, metaverse. And uh, the other uh, direction is uh, virtual worlds. Today we can, like a uh, second life, like uh, Minecraft and uh, Roblox, other uh, examples, uh, uh, it's at the, uh, the virtual blocks level. Uh, but we can uh, imagine that uh, by 2024, along with the advancement of computation, storage, and other technologies, uh, we can uh, achieve uh, uh, at the uh, virtual dust level. And eventually by 2027, uh, we can uh, uh, be at the virtual elementary particles level. So that's my personal prediction, but I believe that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Uh, so uh, lastly, I'd like to talk about that uh, recently, this is my non actively work. So me and uh, uh, another uh, uh, 10 experts, we collectively created a report, a free report called the Metaverse Decoded by Top Experts. Uh, so you can uh, uh, take a free download and read that. Uh, in this report, we uh, discussed the definition of the Metaverse uh, the concepts that are currently labeled as a metaverse, but are not actually the metaverse. And uh, we predicted the biggest technical challenge in creating a true metaverse. And we talked about the uh, most noteworthy risk in the metaverse from an ESG perspective. Also the sign that the metaverse is really facing an explosive growth in business and uh, several other topics. So, um, I'd also like to take this chance to thank our experts. Some of them are also uh, with us today uh, as speakers or panelists. And uh, our plan is to release uh, the next uh, installment of this series in September, addressing technology patterns and standards. And also the last one, uh, market and investment uh, to be released in December. So this is uh, uh, the end of my uh, presentation and I put my contact information on the uh, window. So you can feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or drop me an email. And again, download the report. Uh, you're very welcome. So I believe that's, uh, uh, I'll give it back to Moria. Great, thank you, you for sharing um, that broad overview and also helps setting the stage for the discussions today. Uh, from Tom Furness, um, the grandfather of virtual reality, uh, about, uh, well, through the store window. Tom, please go ahead. Well, this is an interesting title of looking through the window um, and some thoughts about the importance of standards as we progress. Uh, certainly, Juan has already mentioned a number of these things. And it's clear as we go into this very complex 
interaction between the real world and the digital world, that we need to have a way to guide ourselves through this, a map to help us. And the standards are going to be a very important part of that. But let's go back in time, about 50 years ago. Uh, here is a young uh, Tom Furness. I must have been about uh, eight years old at this time. And uh, I'm actually looking through a window into a store. And uh, we didn't have television in our home, but my parents would often uh, uh, take uh, me and my brother uh, to, uh, to these appliance stores. And we would look to the window with the television sets that were there. And, and as I watched these programs, I was thinking, good grief, this is amazing. Just think of the idea of having a, a movie theater in your home and what that can mean. And you can go turn it on any time and you could interact with that at least one way of watching these programs. So I was thrilled at the prospects and even anticipated what it must be like to have that happen. And about three years later, it did happen. And it was marvelous to have that uh, other entity in our home uh, that brought the world to us. Now, it was pretty crude at the time. Uh, the local television station was uh, over 150 miles away, and the, the picture was sort of fuzzy and and, and things like that. But still, Mr. Wizard Science Secrets was my most favorite program. And uh, it got me started on uh, the trajectory I'm on. Well, let's fast forward a little bit, another 20 years. And uh, I finished uh, uh, university in electrical engineering and uh, was commissioned as an officer in the Air Force. And here I am now, uh, grown up and have a real job and uh, to practice uh, uh, the kind of things I've been excited about over my whole lifetime up to that point. And so my job was really an interesting one. This is during the Vietnam War period and pretty much my job was to determine how to interface a human to an advanced machine. And the fact that there was a lot of complexity in this, if we look at the, uh, looking through the glass that the pilot has to do, uh, as well as um, the way that uh, you would interact with how to control this machine as it flies through three-dimensional space. A lot of complexity here. And the question is, how is this going to work? And that was the problem I was trying to solve of how to interface this human to this machine that would allow us to travel through this three-dimensional space. So it turns out that uh, it was clear that we weren't going to get there by using a lot of physical technology because it just was not a very good coupling to the human visual system and other systems. They were basically three-dimensional beings and we see and hear and touch in three dimensions. And anytime we deviate from that, going into two-dimensional interfaces, we were, just weren't getting there. So I started a program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to develop a new way. And this was actually, instead of looking at real displays, we would look at virtual displays and interact with that by using our natural psychomotor capabilities. And you see here on the left, um, the world's first, well, for the Air Force, uh, head-mounted display, a virtual projection to one eye um, that gave a 30-degree field of view virtual image projected in, at optical infinity. And of course, it would move as you moved your head around. And then on the right, you saw a tracking system. Here's Lieutenant Furness, again, wearing this head-mounted tracking system, wherever you moved your head in position of an infinity culminated reticle over a real-world target or area, you would then triangulate on that helmet and determine where you're looking relative to the cockpit. And then what I did is I put these two together. So now we had an ability to have a moving window of a virtual display and actually know where that display was relative to the real world. And this is what now became what we call visually coupled systems. And I continued to work on this technology for 23 years of how in the world we would build ultimately a cockpit the pilot wears with the idea of an intimate coupling into our visual, acoustic and, and tactile senses in order to get this circumambience of information that was three-dimensional that would help us take in more bandwidth than we'd ever be able to do otherwise. In order to demonstrate this, and the uh, starting in the uh, late uh, 70s and early 80s, I worked on this simulator, what we call our Darth Vader simulator, the visually coupled airborne system simulator. And what this would do is give us a 
a 20 degree instantaneous field of view um, with uh, two eyes and with a 16 bit electromagnetic tracking system that will let us create basically this circumambience. So what you would now see is normally what you'd have in a cockpit uh, looks like this, you would now have a picture that um, looks like this. And so what we did was fuse all the information from the various sensors to make a picture. And this picture became a gestalt, a way to get rapid information into the brain of this pilot, where pretty much all information was in, a, in a, this one confluence and fusion of information. And so we started doing experiments with this and uh, with our VCAS, our Darth Vader helmet, and found out it was remarkable, transformational, what was happening in terms of what pilots could do. And indeed, we have these technologies now emerging in modern fighter aircraft. It takes a while for it to get there. But at that point in time, when I put that helmet on for the first time, I realized, oh my goodness, what have we done? This is, this is going to change everything in terms of the way we interface with computers, the way we interface with uh, information that is out there in the world. So since that time in uh, 1966, when I started working on this, I spent 23 years in the Air Force and then another 30, 32 years uh, as an academic at the University of Washington. And I beat my sword into a plowshare to take this technology that I'd worked on for many years and apply it to things that have to do with medicine and education and, um, and design and entertainment. And over the years, uh, spun off 27 companies, generated 300 patents. Uh, and then these, um, uh, we had um, these companies that became some of the background or some of the core to help bring what we know today as virtual reality and augmented reality into the world. Now, along the way, I also realized back in, um, uh, and, and, uh, 1993, the movie came out, Lawnmower Man. Lawnmower Man, I was asked to be a technical advisor on that movie. I read the script and I said, oh no, this is taking this wonderful technology that gets high bandwidth to and from the brain. And it's, it's casting it on, in a dystopian way. Uh, a dystopian way. I, I, we didn't want this to happen. And the people are going to get a wrong idea about what VR is about. And that's when I started the Virtual Real Society to begin with at that time, to be sort of a counter influence on the things that were going to happen with the movie makers of what VR was about. It's way more than that. It's a way that actually can be transformative to humans. So over these years, I've been working on this technology, probably longer than anyone else uh, uh, alive uh, continuously. Uh, these are the things I've discovered that certainly this is unprecedented, an unprecedented medium that helps us experience wonder. All you have to do is put on a headset, you become a kid again. And uh, also you can be present, go anywhere, anytime. And you never forget it because being immersed, that means you're awakening the, our spatial memory. And it's like going to Disneyland. Once you go to Disneyland, you never forget it. It's like putting a place inside of you by putting you in a place. It allows us to change perspectives by looking through other people's eyes and the things that influence them, things that are important to them. And it basically moves our minds. It's a mind mover. So these were the things that I learned, but at the same time I learned, oh my goodness, what we've done is unlocked, it's like splitting an atom, an incredible amount of energy. What is going to happen when we're able to imprint on the brain with permanent ink? That means we have a, a great obligation to make sure that these worlds that people experience are basically uplifting edifying rather than degrading. We don't want to practice killing people in virtual worlds because you never forget it. So let's go back to the basics. You know, we grow up on this, in this world of atoms. Here we are inside of this. We have our red circle, which is our body, our sensory end organs, things like that. And, and inside of that, we have our gray matter. Uh, sort of uh, our brain 
and our mind. And we interact in this world of atoms. There are other people there that we interact with through our uh, sensory, uh, perceptual, and cognitive capabilities and memory. So um, we also have created, of course, worlds of bits. And these bits are sort of a pieces of information that uh, even from the beginning, we started expressing ourselves that way uh, with cave paintings and so forth. And then into radio and telegraph and telephone and television and, and the internet. And so the way we would interact our world of atoms to the world of bits is through some kind of window, a medium that allows us to basically take that in that world of bits into our world of atoms. So we had this bi-world connection. And so the old way was pretty much one way uh, in terms of, especially uh, with the, the television, it wasn't interactive. The telephone was a little more interactive and the telegraph, of course. But um, indeed what happened, of course, is when we got went to the new way of actually bit, what I call fondling bits, uh, like with the internet, we now had a two-way communication channel to this world of bits. So we're still living in the world of atoms, but we're interacting through this media window um, these, uh, with these worlds of bits. Now, look what's happened in the multiverse. Now what's happening is, in a way, this media window disappears. And now we are transported from the world of atoms into the world of bits. And this world of bits is now surrounded by what we call the metaverse. It sort of brings all these bits together. And now we're immersed in this. this. It's like it becomes another world for us. Now, the real question is, what happens when we go back to the world of atoms? You notice we are really sort of changed, our gray matter, because now we have this influence of the world of bits because our spatial memory has been activated. We are changed. We are different. But we can't eat bits. We aren't nourished by them. We, um, we can't necessarily um, uh, breathe bits. We have to breathe atoms. And we have to eat atoms. And we hug atoms. So what does this all mean? this transformation that takes us back in the world of atoms. Because we can't live in the world of bits 24 hours a day. So there is now this duality of the world of bits that go inside of us that we take in the world of atoms. Now, what does that mean? What do we take back to us in the world of atoms? Are we enlarged? Are we contaminated? intoxicated by what's there? And the big question is, are we happier because of what we've experienced in the world of bits? Now, what I would like to take back to my world of atoms would be pretty much expanding my understanding of the way other people think, the, other way, the way other people see the world, other perspectives. That's the only way that I can grow and realize there's more to this than just my very singular view of the world. I want to understand more about what my capabilities really are. I think we aren't even tapping the enormous capability we have because we've been restricted by, uh, in some cases, our media. I'd like to, to expand my knowledge about the universe and develop the skills that I need to get this value exchange, which helps me live in this world of atoms, um, especially to be able to have some income, be able to provide for my family, be able to travel, adventure, and those kinds of things. But also I need, I want to appreciate more how wonderful and incredible the world of atoms really is. The world of bits, yeah, maybe they can help me understand more about the world of atoms. And then of course, this whole unlocking and use of my own potential and how I can couple better my heart and mind to other people. I would like to have that back in my atom world.
So the bottom line is we have to ask us our questions. Are we better in the world of atoms having been in the world of bits? If not, we've got to make the world of bits a lot better that make our world of atoms be what we want them to be. Now, there are a lot of challenges in this, and I've been really close into the interface design part of this, but we have some real concerns. You know, first of all, we aren't there yet with the mechanisms we need, the appliances we need to actually get in, take this human capability into the world of bits. We don't even have a good way to adjust the interpupillary distance and know that we're all spot on. We're really screwing up people's eyes because they are adjusting the interpupillary distance on their headsets. We don't have accommodation that matches the three-dimensional representation of information. Pretty much everything's at optical infinity. Now it's changing, but really slowly. We're wearing things. People don't wanna wear things. They're heavy, they're not balanced, get in the way. And then we have this Q conflict. When we move in this world of bits, and our eyes say we're moving, and yet our vestibular system, no, we're not. We have a Q conflict. Now we're getting around that somewhat, but still it's there. We have to understand we are doing something artificial that will be affecting us in terms of the way we interact in the world of bits. Furthermore, we have not a clue what happens when we're in this world of bits, at least immersively, for a prolonged length of time eight hours a day, one hour a day, day after day after day, there are no longitudinal studies long enough for us to know really what happens. We don't know. We're playing with fire. And then of course, the standards, these have been already discussed, real privacy ethical standards, not to mention to get all these appliances working together. So they talk to each other as we've seen already. So I believe the outcome of getting those bits into the atom world is gonna be a function of the standards that we set. And I'm so excited about what IEEE is doing in this regard with, uh, led by, by you and um, happy to be a part of that. So when we look at standard considerations, we have to take into account pretty much everything, don't we? We have to take into account the way people work, the way that we sense things, the way we process that, what's in our mind, the gray matter you see there, and the world of atoms, which you see in the blue, blue uh, circle. And then of course, there's the metaverse and how the metaverse contains the world of bits and uh, how we, make that something that is accessible so that we can go inside the world of bits and take something hopefully valuable out of that. So there's a lot of moving parts as we think about these standards. And um, these things have been mentioned already. I really think that uh, in addition to getting all the dots connected, we've got to come up with design, design guidelines for this interface. Um, what is a super cockpit? for the human going into the metaverse. And we have to do this in a way we don't constrain. We have to allow for emergence. We can't let it be controlled by special interests, like the argument we had between beta and DHS. Um, and I'm hopefully this will also stimulate this work that we do, uh, grants for research where we look at these longitudinal studies. We've got to do that and especially how we employ the security and safety when we really become vulnerable when we're in this world of bits. Now, the way I like to think about the metaverse is starting off with just us as individuals. We have these amazing talents and skills and things like that. Let's think of ourselves as musicians. We, uh, and probably all of us in this room have been um, protecting, uh, uh, perfecting our ability to play, uh, play our instruments over many years. We're really good at it. We're good soloists and uh, each have our own contribution we can make. But the real fun part is gonna be the symphony hall where we come together to play our instruments. And we 
want to play our instruments in concert with the other musicians. So we create a symphony that lifts all of us, that helps us become more than we could ever become by ourselves individually. And the metaverse can provide that symphony hall for all of us to come together to do that. Even ones who don't know how to play their instruments yet, we can help them learn to play those instruments. So the questions then come from that, well, who writes the score for us to play? Who is the conductor? Where is this symphony hall? These are questions we have to answer. One of the things I've been trying to do since that time in 1993 is to build this virtual world society, which is really a nonprofit to be the conscience of what we're trying to do in the world of bits. To awaken our minds and the link hearts to lift humanity. We want to be this National Geographic Society of the Mind. Um, be able to bring our hearts and minds together to solve these problems. We have a number of projects underway that we're hoping will help promote this metaverse um, uh, activity, including um, projects in homes around the world that will help families understand how they can use this uh, and uh, for education in the home, building these centers of learning and other activities that we hope will help including an alliance for good of we're bringing together these partners they help us do that so we have thousands of people uh, who are really conscientious about wanting to do good and wanting to use the metaverse for that so we certainly have a pull um, that goes along with the push of technology to get us to this point so thank you very much for that i, I hopefully that uh, i know that's a sort of a fifty thousand foot view of the situation but i have high hopes especially now that IEEE Standards Association is involved in this, some of the work that was done with AI, and I'm hopefully we'll have an opportunity to continue to work together with, with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And yes, we can hear you, Steve. So thank you, Tom, for sharing your insights and the 50,000 foot view. Um, and uh, now we will transition over to Steve Mann uh, Steve, please um, uh, start sharing your screen um, so that we can hear your presentation. Thank you very much, Steve. My name's Steve Mann, and I've got, I'm just going to mix in my slide deck and put picture in picture at the lower right of my video feed. And uh, so I want to talk today about XR, the origin and future of the metaverse. Um, see if you can... Can you bring it up there? I've just got somebody here monitoring to make sure that it's coming up um, on that so that I've got, I can close the loop around it. Okay, so now um, let me go to the next slide. So I've been wearing, designing, building, and inventing these wearable computers <clears throat> since my early childhood. And <clears throat> I guess I've been living in, in the metaverse since I was about 12 years old although we didn't call it the metaverse then, but it's just been part of my everyday life and, uh, and part of my own identity and living in my everyday existence, as you can see from my past, uh, including, you know, my passport and everything and how I was defined as some people said, some people called me the world's first cyborg or something like that, although cyborgs have been around for many, many years. Um, I was born in Canada and I took this invention down to MIT about a year before the word metaverse was coined, but it was basically the metaverse in some sense. And uh, right, my immediate, uh, the first thing I did is went to the strobe lab because that was where I always had a fascination with and met with Charles Wyckoff. And Charles Wyckoff and I in 1991 defined XR uh, as any combination of a virtual environment with reality where the virtual environment is responsive to a real or complex valued output from reality by way of real-time computation. And so we had this notion of XR, uh, which, which we extended reality. XR is extended reality or X reality. 
Um, and the metaverse, to my way of thinking, is has to be built on XR because it has to be responsive to the real world. It's not VR and it's not AR either. It really has to be XR because it has to connect to the actual reality we're in at least some of the time. It can't be completely divorced from our real world. It ties to our social networks. Yes, there's virtual things, but it also has to connect to real people, real friends. And at times, not always, but at least some of the time, it must connect to the reality that we live in. And in this way, uh, I'm defining the metaverse very short and succinct. A single, unbounded, universal, immersive XR universe. It is singular in the sense that we share it. It is unbounded in the sense that it is infinite. Uh, it is uh, extensive, infinitely extensible. It is universal um, in the same way, not only is it single, but it's universal. And it's immersive, uh, at least it can be. It's not necessarily always immersive, but it must have the possibility of at least being immersive some of the time. And the single unbounded universal immersive XR universe is something that we used to call back in the day, Connected Collective Humanistic Intelligence or HI, Humanistic Intelligence, Marvin Minsky, the inventor of AI, together with Ray Kurzweil, chief engineer of Google and myself, the three of us uh, wrote a paper on this, kind of defining it that way. So this is kind of going back. Uh, my grandfather taught me to weld in my childhood and I grew up looking at the world through dark glass. And I came up with this crazy idea of creating a vision that allows people to see beyond the reality that they're in. And uh, this is, I called this meta vision back in 1974 when I started doing this. I used the term meta vision, which is the vision of vision. Meta is a Greek word that means beyond, like a meta joke is a joke about jokes. A meta conversation is a conversation about conversations. And uh, meta vision is the vision of vision, seeing sight and sensing sensors. And this meta vision uh, is something, uh, one of my inventions is called HDR, which I invented back in the 1980s and early 1990s, brought this to MIT, worked with Charles Wyckoff. Uh, when we defined XR, we defined HDR as part of it because it's part of seeing in the eyeglass, the welding glass, whatever it is, seeing the dynamic range and seeing what's in reality, seeing beyond what's the capabilities of human vision, being able to look at electric arc welding and see from the tip of the tungsten electrode on TIG welding to the darkest, deepest shadows all in one across a huge range of spectra, including infrared, ultraviolet, and so on. And so that was kind of the metaverse that we envisioned. I want to include this example here because a lot of people say it's digital and I say it doesn't necessarily have to be digital. This is a piece of art that I created called Burner Phone. It's a piece of social commentary on our throwaway disposal society. What it is, is it's a phone that someone was throwing away and you can probably see it here. Switch to video. You can see it here. Uh, there is a um, phone here that was thrown away and I've got the waveform from that phone burned into this piece of wood with a laser connected to a lock-in amplifier. And this piece here is this phenomenological reality. It's neither digital nor device dependent, but it still embraces the ideal the concept of that sort of reality. Let me switch back to picture and picture there. And so burner phone is, is just a good use case uh, of, of what we mean by this extended reality to be able to see radio waves, for example. The uh, fractal nature of the metaverse is evident here. The human mind and body are inextricably intertwined and the two work together. And you can see that the mind and body form a feedback loop of efferent and afferent nerves. We also have the human machine, which is when the human mind and body together, if you look at the leftmost piece, it shrinks down to human in the, in the next diagram. And the human machine, therefore, is the sensors and senses that also form a feedback loop between the human and technology, such as eyeglass, for example. And then the human machine also exists within human machines, which is a plurality. It's a shared experience. The metaverse is not just one person, it's shared. And human machines, there must be surveillance and surveillance. Surveillance is when we're being watched and 
surveillance is when we're being watched means oversight in English and surveillance S O U S as in sous chef or you know under uh, means undersight. And you must have both surveillance and surveillance in order to close the loop on human machines in the smart city. Otherwise, you have a totalitarian surveillance-only society that doesn't really serve the interests of individual people. So one of the things, the early example of metaverse in my childhood, one of my childhood hobbies was photographing and seeing electromagnetic radio waves in, the, in, in, in this metaverse. And uh, in, in some ways, so this is something called the sequential wave and printing machine. This is this is a little thing that started when I was back in the, back here. I've got some television screens and things like that. I fixed televisions when I was growing up and turned them into graph plotting machines as a fun little hobby. And eventually, when I was 12 years old, my dad got me this cathode ray oscillograph RCA, and it wasn't working properly. It only the dot only went up and down on the electron beam. It didn't go left to right. So I was impatient and wanted to see something. So I put it on rollers like this, so I could slide it back and forth on what I uh, ate for, which was just kind of a new thing at the time. And then I discovered something quite remarkable when I connected it to a police radar or a marine radar. I could see the waveform sitting there from that uh, device by the Doppler shift it created, and it was an interesting discovery. And I called it the sequential wave and printing machine because it sequentializes these waves. And here's an example. This is a, a modern replica of that invention, just with a row of green LEDs. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it allows us to see electromagnetic radio waves. So I have here a smartphone, and I can see the electromagnetic radio waves coming from it. I don't need any eyeglasses to see that. It's, it, and it's not digital. It's completely analog. So it's a, a metaverse. It's completely analog. It's shared. It's universal. And it doesn't require any device to experience it. You don't need any special eyeglasses. It's self-evident to anybody standing in this room with me who can see it with their naked eye. And when, it, when I'm closer to the phone, the waves are stronger. And when I'm further away, they're weaker. And if I go through a block of wood, you can see that the waves will be attenuated. They'll be weaker going through a block of wood than they are when they're not going through that block of wood. And if I go through a block of cement, they're even weaker. And if I go through a block of wood and a block of cement together, they're even weaker, but still visible. You can still see those waves. Notice that you can still see them even though I'm going through a block of wood and cement. Now, if I put my hand in front of it, do you think it'll block more or less of the waves than the wood and the cement? And so the answer is, when I put my hand in front of it, it almost completely blocks the waves. So why does my hand block more of the waveform than, than uh, the cement and the wood combined. Um, and the answer, of course, is that the hand has moisture in it, water. So uh, if you hold your phone like this, the smart people, you can hear. But if you hold your phone like this, of course, nobody can hear you because the waves can't get it. The radio waves are blocked by the flesh. And so that's an example of a metaverse that is not digital and it's uh, shared, but without any need devices needed. So I just want to make sure we understand what the metaverse is in this wide sense. So this is 1974. This is one of the pictures from my childhood of electromagnetic radio waves. And this is a rolling wave, a crawling wave. And this is what I call a sitting wave. You see a standing wave is the sum of two waves traveling in opposite directions. This thing here I call it a sitting wave is the product of two waves traveling in the same direction. And here's a comparison of standing wave and sitting wave. Uh, so it's a new discovery, shearing the space-time continuum to create a new reality. And this was one of the things I brought down to MIT and showed people and everybody really loved it. This was the metaverse that I brought down there in 1991. Uh, and, and of course, it wasn't called that until, until 1992. Um, and here is MetaVision. So all of these... Uh, fixtures that you find in washrooms and so on have little cameras in them that have a, usually it's a linear array of 1,024 pixels and a one-dimensional camera usually that uh, towards uh, depth and uh, depth information. It's a depth camera. And so we've never been able to see these before, but this is the first time in human history that we can see and photograph this metaverse. So now we can uh, see and live in a shared metaverse that shows the meta vision. This is the vision of vision, sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. 
Uh, there's an old saying, who watches the watchers? But nobody asked the question until now, who watches the watching? Who senses the censors? Who, and, and so this is Stanford Neuroscience Surgery with the sequential wave and printing machine in the cadaver lab developing new surgical procedures using the metaverse and this is our, our work at Stanford, and I'm doing work in collaboration with Michelle Cleo and some other doctors on the metaverse in medicine. And here is uh, the metaverse. Just this is really nice to be able to see and share and, and, and see that baby there can see and understand and interact with this metaverse without having to wear any special eyeglasses. It's very approachable. It's very immediate. We can see and understand it. Here's two uh, microphones and their interference pattern, the capacity to listen. This is meta vision, meta sensing, because we're sensing these microphones. And as we move them closer together, you can see that the interference pattern spreads apart. These are photographs of the sequential wave and printing machine. So this is a multiple exposure a sequence of photographs uh, of this. Uh, here's a photograph of me together with two Shure SM58 microphones and the sequential wave and printing machine, where you can see the interference pattern between the two. Um, uh, microphones and that uh, lock in amplifier uh, on the bottom there is something that we made in collaboration with Sun Yatsen University in my lab to replicate the machine that I built in my childhood uh, in a, using modern technology. This is uh, the bits and atoms and genes model that Yu Yan talked about. Um, so near the origin, we have bits, atoms, and genes, and as we extend out, we've got physical scale. Uh, virtual scale and valence, which is the social political scale, uh, the valence, surveillance, and surveillance. And so, if we look at that, there's a fractal nature of these of this valence. Manfred Klein's coined the term cyborg, and he said his favorite example was a person riding a bicycle. So I have here a simple example, uh, a simple showing the mind selves, selves and technology, selves and society, society in the city and global cities. So what we have is, again, that same fractal nature of HI. And here I've used a bicycle as the example rather than eyeglasses. Same idea, though. Um, now, technology that becomes part of us uh, is very evident in uh, some humor that we look at, like very funny Scotty now beam me up my clothes. And this idea that clothing ought to be part of us is sort of implicit or natural or naturally understood. Uh, even a car we think of as part of us, like when two cars collide, uh, as as uh, Nahum Gershon and I wrote in one of our research papers that uh, one person will say, you hit me, uh, rather than your car hit my car. So we think of the car as part of ourselves, bicycles, as Manfred Klein's was the favorite example, but I think largely vehicles in general uh, can fall into that clothes and vehicles. And, and in some sense, I regard a car as simply loose-fitting clothing. And in this way, I think of a car as kind of in the wearable space and self-driving cars and smart cars are in the wearables universe that I'm interested in. More generally, I come up with the concept of environment. Um, the environment is that which surrounds us and the environment is us ourselves. And a spacesuit is a perfect example where that boundary is pretty crisp and sharply defined and quite important. Um, but I take the point, I argue that cyborgs existed more than a million years ago. Manfred Klein, who coined the term cyborg, says his favorite example is a person riding a bicycle, and bicycles are only 200 years old. But I think equally well, a person with a vessel could be considered a cyborg as much as a bicycle. And vessels such as stand-up paddle boards, uh, years ago people would stand on logs and float down a river. So more than a million years ago, vessels did exist. And that tells me that cyborgs have existed longer than the invention of the wheel, longer than the existence of Homo sapiens, and certainly longer than the invention of clothing. Here is what we mean by environment, environment. This is one of those fun balls you run around on the lake in the water and you stay inside the ball and run around like a hamster. And if we look at that ball, say sitting here in the park, and we label that, the environment is that which is in the ball and the environment is that which is outside the ball. And the ball is two meters in diameter, so it has a radius of one meter. So we can think of a circle with radius one meter on the plane here, or in three dimensions, actually, a sphere um, or ball. And uh, the environment is shown in green here with the dotted line, and the environment is shown in red here. And the environment, I like to think of the vessel as part of the human. In other words, I like to think of the vessel as part of the environment. 
the vessel itself, I call that environment because there's no word for car, boat, plane, uh, all those things. There's no one word that describes all of those things. So I call it environment, the, the container. The ball is the environment and it defines and boundaries the environment versus environment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about realities. There's a whole bunch of different realities, VR, AR, phenomenal reality, XR, XYR, MR, MixR, you know, QR. There's all these different R's. And um, what's most important is that I think the origin should be the sensory deprivation tank of nothingness. This is a VR float tank that we made many, many years ago, back in the early 1990s. Um, and that VR float tank gives us the origin. Uh, it gives us mercivity. It gives us the zero at the origin. So I've got here drawn multidimensional space. Uh, you, Yuan, and I, and Tom Furness, and a bunch of us wrote a paper on this. And what we have is we, we, we kind of came to this consensus that the origin should be total sensory deprivation and reality should be one of the axes. Virtuality should be another axis. And there's a whole bunch of different axes here. And it's, it, the main thing is it's a multidimensional space with a clearly defined origin. Um, this whole thing started really, if we think of the world's first cyborgs, the, at the most primordial sense, it's all about water-human computer interaction. And for the last 24 years, we've run a conference, Water HCI, uh, at the intersection of water humans and technology. And uh, if we think of where water and humans intersect, uh, we can have we can swim, drink, or fish, or, or sunbathe. Like we can either put the water inside us as we drink, or we can put ourselves in the water as we swim, or we can uh, separate from it and be fishing or sunbathing by the beach. And so there's clearly defined, and Mark Matson and I wrote about this in a recent research paper, uh, where humans and technology intersect, <clears throat> we've got cyborgs. And you can either put the human in the technology, like clothing or cars, <clears throat> or you can put the technology in the human, like implantable chips and so on. And so <clears throat> we can make that same taxonomy or ontology for the play between humans and, and technology. And likewise, water and technology. <clears throat> the water can go inside the technology or the technology can go in the water. On the right, you've got some simple examples here <clears throat> of that taxonomy. This is sort of one of my favorite hobbies. I like swim in the winter. We swim year round. We have a group called Swim OP, Swim at Ontario Place Facebook group. OP stands for Ontario Place. We call them swim ops. We do a swim op almost every day. <clears throat> and uh, um, here's a swim op. And uh, in the winter, we swim in the winter. And one of the things that we like to do, that's me on a piece of ice. I swim over to a piece of ice and paddle for a while until it disintegrates or falls apart or sinks and then swim over to the next one. What I love about the ice is it's an ephemeral vessel. It's a fragile vessel. And there's something magical about this ephemeral boundary between us and our environment. It's the opposite of a spaceship. A spaceship is a rigid, strong vessel. A little piece of ice is the most fragile ephemeral vessel you could possibly imagine putting you right in the drink unexpectedly, you're almost guaranteed to swim. Um, uh, even though you're in a no swimming zone, you're not allowed to swim there, but you know, you can paddleboard there and paddleboarding is like the same as swimming more. Or less. And so growler boarding, as we call it, is standing in a growler sized piece of ice. And back in 1991, Charles Wyckoff and I wrote about this, uh, about growler detection uh, with the, one of the first water HCI systems that was built was this marine radar system for detecting these growlers, which do great damage to ships, and they're quite hazardous to ships, but they're invisible to traditional radar, and we built the world's first radar that can see growlers. So here, to head up display, interacting with growlers in a fun and playful sort of way as a game. Um, Fountain Hopping is a tradition at Stanford University. Uh, when, if anyone goes to Stanford University, you will see hundreds of people in bathing suits walking across campus carrying pool float toys, and they hang out in the fountains, and that's a normal thing. I did, uh, I think I, there was another professor and I who did most of her lectures in the fountain, um, showing different properties of water and waterproof oscilloscope, measuring wave fronts and studying waves and different things like that. This is a water robot for physical fitness. It does evasive maneuvers. It's a water fighting robot. This is an example of XR that is shared because they're connected to the internet and they're having a water fight with someone at another location remotely. And we're in this universal space. The space is universal, it's persistent, it's infinite, and it's immersive. There's nothing more immersive than, if you have to put on a bathing suit to enter a space, it's pretty immersive. 
so this is Hydraulophone, world's first true water instrument. Uh, one of my inventions, Hydraulophone here. Um, and the Hydraulophone is a piece of public art, but it's also a piece of the metaverse. Again, this is an example of the metaverse that does not require any special eyeglasses. It doesn't require any special equipment. Anybody can participate in it. And this is a shared splash page, for example. This is a piece of metaverse where you touch these ray of water jets and it springs up in another country and somebody else pushes their hand and you push. You can engage and you can touch and be touched by water and by other humans through the internet or through the metaverse, as we might call it now. And my daughter explained it at a little conference here uh, and lots of people enjoy having this play in the metaverse. And it's very primordial, it's very simple, it's very easy to understand. Here's my two-year-old taking it all apart and fixing it, putting it all back together. And so this is uh, uh, the, the notion of a metaverse water over internet protocol is what one thing that we came up with. It was called WIPE, W-O-I-P. You touch one fountain, it pops up somewhere else in another country. Again, this is an example of a metaverse in the most primordial sense as at the origins of cyborgs when we were first cyborgs on vessels I mean, more than a million years ago. So this uh, piece here of metaverse captures more than a million years of human humans, water, and technology. And uh, this is my lab in Copenhagen. Uh, we set this up as a fun little, it's just kind of a fun, playful uh, place to be. Hydraulic coast, a safe swim, swim OP, uh, we do at the beach at Ontario Place, we do beach cleanup, there's all kinds of debris. We locate it using augmented reality, virtual reality, X reality really, uh, and swim down. And like if there's pieces that are too big for me to pull out, I, uh, I'll locate it and tag it and then I'll swim down, tie a rope to it and get a bunch of people on dry land to pull it out. There was this rusty old railing that was hurting people. So I swam down and tied a rope to it. And um, another fellow MIT alum and I, uh, heaved on it. Well, we got a bunch of people on shore to pull on it and we got it out of there. And um, so this is metaverse. This is fully immersive underwater XR. Uh, we call it immersivity. Uh, and uh, water HCI, we have a swim community, a swim up, swim at Ontario Place. We now have 977 members. Um, and uh, we're interested in water justice and indigenous indigenous rights. Like uh, there's no, the park closes at 11 p.m. So we kind of made a joke, no stargazing, sky closed 11 p.m. Water, no swimming, fire, no campfires without paying fee, uh, earth land, no trespassing and air sky, no stargazing after 11 p.m. So this is kind of the indigenous circle of park land. Um, and uh, in concluding, what I want to say is that what is very important to me is the metaverse accessibility. One of the things is the metaverse is not accessible. I'm so angry with Zoom that um, I kind of think that we almost should pause the metaverse for a minute and see if we can get phones working. Like, why is it that someone that Zoom can't call? Like, what if I wanted to bring in someone from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, from an Amish community who happened to be willing to use a phone booth, but not much more than that, uh, calling on a rotary phone? and patch them into Zoom. Why can't I do that? I used to be a DJ on a radio show and I could call people and put them on the air. Why can't you call someone in Zoom and put them on the air? Why is it that I had to struggle so many hours to get this Zoom to work? Uh, uh, when in fact, it should be easy. Uh, it should be possible for an organizer on a conference to call someone in and put them on the air. So I was suggesting that we go to standards based. The metaverse needs standards. Uh, like there are standards like Jitsi, for example, is a video conferencing program that adheres to standards. So in some sense, I feel we should boycott Zoom. We should ban Zoom. We've made a lot of headway within the university accessibility community. We decided to switch from Zoom and go to Jitsi and do everything on Jitsi for accessibility reasons. Because many people need, with special needs, need a way to connect to these things. To the extent that the metaverse is built to exclude people with special needs is in some sense, I think that's an evil. And we're already, we already have that with Zoom. We already have video conferencing that excludes people. So how can we make sure the metaverse doesn't go down the same uh, awful hole that Zoom went, uh, takes us? So anyway, we need to work together to accessibility to make the metaverse accessible. And that's what the hydraulophone does. Anybody can play the hydraulophone. You know, somebody six months old can jump into the metaverse 
you know, children from all over the world can play water with each other and have a water fight across Irish Bay, or play water and have fun with water and share it, share water as a medium. So water is a fluid medium. What I call, I coined the term fluid user interface or fluid interface is in the context of HCI. And so this idea of fluid interfaces. So many of the ter concepts that I came up with, like like uh, um, HDR, fluid interfaces, fluid user interfaces, um, uh, and and uh, <clears throat> jointly XR, uh, Wyckoff and I came up with that one. Um, I think that if we put these all together, we need to highlight accessibility first. I think that's where the IEEE should stand first and foremost, because everything else will happen. The industry will rush out like mad to get everybody's brain hooked up. I founded a, uh, I co-founded a company called Interaxon that makes a brain computer interface, perhaps the world's most advanced BCI right now. And that company was founded right here in this room here at, at home. I'm at home now, my wife and two children and I, uh, the four of us live upstairs and downstairs, here's my lab. So I'm at home now. And um, this is where we founded Interaxon right in my home originally and then we grew. So it's very near and dear to our heart, brain computer interface, BCI. Uh, and, and there's lots going on there. What we need in the IEEE is a standard. And that's why I'm working with Yu Yuan, Moira, Azim, Perva, a bunch of us and anyone else who wants to join us, please join us and try to define the standards of the metaverse, especially with an emphasis on accessibility, because that's something that nobody else will do. That's something that industry will, will, may run roughshod over. And we need an organization like the IEEE to take a stand on issues like that. So if any of you want to take a stand, you believe strongly in issues, uh, join us here and let's have some fun and work together. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for ending on that important note as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I think the open invitation that Steve made, uh, please do contact us. Um, this is early stages and I think the, the work is still being shaped. So we look forward to hearing from anyone interested. All right, with that and to stay on track, I would like to invite uh, Rev Leveradian uh, from NVIDIA uh, to share uh, his thoughts with us, and I see you are ready to go, so please go ahead. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to present here, especially following all these um, other great presentations from the luminaries um, uh, we, just, we just witnessed. Um, uh, I hope my connection is okay. I happen to be on vacation in Peru. I'm in Machu Picchu, so this is in the hotel, hotel room over here. I don't know. Uh, how well this is coming through, but let's let's just bear through it. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into my background like some of the others because uh, I have a lot of other things to talk about. But maybe just for some context, um, I, I started um, playing with computer graphics at a pretty young age in the 80s. I'm pretty old now, I'm 46, uh, but uh, not as old as, as Tom and uh, as much experience as him. But uh, I fell in love with computer graphics because of the idea of using computers and algorithms uh, to synthesize worlds and and create images that would let us perceive them. Um, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was born in Los Angeles and I turned 18 the year Jurassic Park came out. So that led me to, um, uh, to my first jobs in the industry. I worked at Warner Brothers and at Disney uh, writing renderers and doing simulation uh, for creating images for movies. Um, eventually, I, I uh, started my own company, developing my own renderer that I licensed to all of them, which led me to NVIDIA 20 years ago, where, where the introduction of uh, programmability to, to our GPUs uh, presented the promise of turning everything that I'd been doing previously uh, in the offline world, it, trying to do accurate, photorealistic, um, physical representations of the world into a real-time experience that promised uh, potentially to become an immersive one. So for the last 20 years here at NVIDIA, uh, I've been working towards trying to take everything that, that we've been learning in computer graphics and 3D simulation and, and um, turning it into an everyday experience that, um, that is like, like our 
human um, uh, experience in the real world. So with that, I'd like to present uh, our view of, of what uh, the metaverse is. To some extent, it's probably a fool's errand to try to define the metaverse. It's sort of like trying to define what the internet was in 1993 when the World Wide Web uh, appeared and it exploded. Um, there, were, there were many terms that people are trying to put forth as, as um, uh, the name for this thing. There's the information superhighway, there was cyberspace, which now kind of still exists, but not, um, uh, not in the original way it was intended. Um, we'll see what, what this ends up being called. Um, the way we, we see it, uh, the metaverse is not a specific place. It's not, um, it's not one particular, uh, space you occupy, whether it's Second Life or a, a Roblox game or, or Fortnite or something like that. The metaverse is more like the internet, uh, in that, um, it's, it's a concept, it's a network uh, uh, that interconnects all of these different uh, bits of information, experiences, things you can do and interact with, um, but, but we're extending it. Um, today, uh, today we have, uh, we believe that we're essentially in the second phase of the internet. Uh, I happen to be in the, uh, on the internet and using it well before the web existed. Uh, in the in the late 80s and the early 90s before 1993 and it was an amazing place even back then um, the interface however was extremely limited uh, you had a very slow slow modem connecting you to uh, to some unix server usually and you'd have to go type in a whole bunch of commands into this uh, prompt the interface was essentially just text um, uh, and but it was amazing because you could connect and uh, have conversations and uh, interact with people and share information all over the world instantaneously. But the second phase was introduced in 1993 when we changed this interface. Uh, instead of it being primarily uh, just this very abstract text interface that only a computer scientist uh, could really love, to, to something that was more natural and intuitive to most humans, uh, the web introduced the ability to combine imagery with text into these web pages that could then be uh, connected together through hyperlinks, and new web pages could be formed uh, by composing resources and other web pages uh, using those same links into into new ones. You could you could embed images and and text and stuff that was on, on totally different web servers and web pages into, into your own. We see the metaverse as essentially an evolution of this. Uh, the third phase is about, is, is starting and to some extent has already started if you look at what um, kids are doing today in, in uh, their video game worlds. Um, what we see this third phase as is essentially a spatial overlay, a 3D spatial overlay on top of the internet as we see it today. So instead of our interface being um, these 2D worlds with images and text and video, it now becomes something more like, uh, and hopefully eventually exactly like what our experience is out here in the real world. Um, we, Tom, Tom was talking about um, how, how, how much of our, um, intellect, our thinking, our memory is tied to um, 3D space. I mean, we're, we're creatures that, that have evolved to really live inside these 3D worlds and perceive them and operate on them. And so adding this interface to the internet is essentially going to um, uh, amplify the, the uses and the usage of the internet, probably by the orders of magnitude that the introduction of the web did to the pre-web internet. I mean, before the web internet, um, the internet, there was maybe thousands of people, tens of thousands, uh, maybe a hundred thousand people that were using it. The web turned it into millions and now billions of people using it uh, uh, a lot of the time. We think that this, this next, next phase is going to make it even greater, whatever that is. Um, the metaverse, 
can't be just done by one entity, by one company. Um, it kind of doesn't even make sense. It's like saying the internet uh, is, is one company. By definition, it's going to be created by many. And it's going to be um, uh, a combination of different types of craftsmen and people that build this. Artists, computer scientists and developers, various companies and individuals, and even the artificial intelligences that we're creating. They're going to be contributing to building this, this metaverse with us. Um, assisting us, or in some cases, maybe building it themselves. Uh, one thing that's particularly interesting to me about, about this future uh, internet with uh, 3D spatial overlay is that previous to this, largely the internet that we've built and the experiences that we've built have been done by software engineers and computer scientists. Uh, the designs we have for how we interact the, the things that we built to interact with each other uh, in, in um, social media and, and all of the uh, things we associate with the, with the web today or, or our mobile apps, they're designed by people who, who know how to program computers and build computers, but don't necessarily really know that much about how to build spaces that, that are good for society. Uh, that are places that you want to be, where you want to interact with others. Um, and so I think this metaverse is going to, the metaverse, this next stage of the internet, is going to invite some traditional craftsmen in, in areas that, that are very, uh, that have a long history in, in human development. We're going to need architects to design the physical spaces that we inhabit. We're going to need um, urban designers, uh, urban planners, people who know how to create parks and museums and curate them to, to help define this. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, we, we also believe that this, um, this new era of the internet will be defined by a link back to the real world in a much greater way. We already have some links in the current internet to the real world. Uh, many people can control the lighting and temperature in their in their homes through through an app on their phone or through a web page uh, by by sending control signals and monitoring what's going on inside their inside their homes. Uh, we do a lot of our businesses and operate a lot of our businesses that are with real world implications. Uh, you know, managing logistics of our supply chains and all of that using using the internet today. Uh, but as we create um, a view into this information, into what Tom called the world of bits that, that matches um, more closely to, to, the, to the world of atoms, to the real world, we have more opportunities to link the two together. We can make them um, uh, intrinsically linked, make them identical and um, uh, uh, We'll, so we'll explore some of those opportunities in, in the next few few slides. Um, the the point five we ha I have over here. Uh, this is one that I think is not talked about enough. Uh, we all know that that we're in this new age of artificial intelligence. It started about ten years ago when um, at the University of Toronto they discovered uh, an a way to take an old algorithm, neural networks, and combine it with all this new data we have from the internet on top of supercomputers um, available to consumers in the form of NVIDIA's gaming cards, GPUs, and produce new algorithms that were previously impossible for humans to create. We were able to finally robustly tell the difference between a cat and a dog and an image. And this has led us to some great miraculous uh, new algorithms that, that we're still exploring. Uh, we believe that the next wave of AIs that we're going to create to truly become intelligent and advanced, we need to provide them with experience. Uh, they need to have millions of years of lived experience operating on the world, perceiving it, uh, moving things around inside the world, manipulating atoms, and the only way we're really going to be able to provide this kind of experience to our AIs is by, by constructing virtual worlds for them to go be born in and to be raised in. Um, that we, can't, we can't allow our robots 
our self-driving cars to learn inside the real world in the same way that our babies do. We wouldn't want our self-driving cars practicing their driving on our, on our roads. We wanna, we wanna ensure that before we put them in the world of atoms, that they're really smart and they, they understand uh, virtually all possible scenarios and situations, no matter how unlikely, and, and we'll know how to react to them well before um, uh, we inflict them on the rest of us. So we believe the metaverse is the natural place for them to be grown and raised. And once they're there, they're also gonna help us build out parts of the metaverse or large parts of it because um, uh, we just don't have enough people to build uh, who, are, who are expert craftsmen to build all the things that we need in this place. And finally, um, we feel that the, the metaverse isn't really tied to any particular device or mode of, of connecting to it. The metaverse itself um, is this um, 3D spatial overlay. Uh, you can think of them as connected worlds, a kind of 3D, three-dimensional web. Uh, but there will be many ways to, to enter this. Um, to start with, we already have 2D devices. We have our phones and, and tablets, and we have our laptops. Uh, these two-dimensional screens are a way that people are already interacting with 3D worlds. Uh, you can look at video games and how they're evolving into places that people just hang out in instead of not, not, just, not just play, but to socialize and interact with each other. Um, that's a perfectly fine way for us to, to uh, interact with it. But uh, we're producing more immersive ways of interacting with it, which is really exciting. These are all the VR, XR, AR devices that we're seeing. And eventually, uh, we'll have brain-computer interfaces that bypass our actual senses. We'll go straight to the brain directly, and that'll be even more immersive. But today, we can already start interacting with the metaverse without having to have um, uh, a new, new fancy devices that, that immerse us in it completely as much as we would like that. Um, we believe that the virtual worlds that will comprise the metaverse are already extremely powerful and useful for industries. Um, it's largely when we talk about the metaverse these days, the conversation seems to reflect mostly around entertainment and, um, and social, um, social kinds of interactions. Uh, but if you look at what the internet and the web on top of the internet has, has been used for, of course it's been used for gaming, it's been used for uh, social media and all of that, but the implications of the internet and the web are, were, were far greater and continue to be far greater than just consumer type experiences. Uh, we work on the internet. We use the internet and the, and the web to, to build things. We, we have people who plan cities and buildings and tunnels and bridges uh, communicate with each other on the internet and share plans and designs and, and, and do things together there. This will continue. With the metaverse, it's gonna be even easier to do this and it's going to unlock many other possibilities. We're already starting to use these 3D worlds to do a great many things. There's some examples here of stuff that, that we've contributed to at NVIDIA. On the top left, we have an example of how we train our, uh, our robots using reinforcement learning, where they have virtual worlds. Uh, we can have thousands and thousands of these virtual robots practicing how to open a drawer without breaking it and, and applying just the right amount of pressure uh, when, when grabbing a, a handle so that they're smart, smart before we unleash them on the real world. In the top middle, we have Ericsson using our Omniverse platform to simulate. Um, they created a digital twin of, I believe that's part of London, and they can simulate the uh, 5G uh, radio signals uh, given placements and configurations of their towers and, and where the receivers are so that they can optimize uh, all of that within, within the city. Uh, we have use cases where, where we, we can uh, train and optimize fleets of robots inside warehouses uh, uh, that, that could be used to transport things around them. You can simulate, or we're, we're working towards building a 
a, an accurate simulation over long periods of time of the Earth's climate um, uh, at high resolutions, one meter resolution on the Earth. Uh, we're building a supercomputer for this. Being able to, to create a digital twin of the Earth um, and, and simulate it over long periods of time is obviously going to be extremely useful for solving many of the problems that we face with climate change. Uh, the bottom there, um, we have uh, work we've been doing with Siemens Energy on building digital twins of, of, of uh, power plants so that we can uh, predict when there's going to be failures and fix them well before it becomes a problem, increasing the efficiency and uh, uh, energy uh, output of, uh, of, of, these, of these plants. And finally, at the bottom right, we have our autonomous vehicle simulator we call DriveSim, where we build a digital twin of various cities and places that don't actually exist in many cases so that we can uh, train and test our, our um, autonomous vehicles uh, for billions and billions of miles well, be well before we, we deploy them into the real world. Um, simulating these virtual worlds is, is extremely hard. Uh, we've been we've been working on uh, technologies and and research towards um, building these virtual worlds and representing them with physical accuracy as well as simulating them for decades now and uh, it's still it's still a grand challenge it's probably the the most challenging challenge of of all time in computer science because if you think about it, simulating everything in the world is kind of everything. There's there's nothing past that. So um, uh, we will be working towards this for decades to come and probably never reach a complete simulation of everything in, in the universe uh, uh, in total, totally accurately. But the steps along the way are still extremely useful. If we can build um, uh, accurate enough facsimiles of the real world, then, then we gain a lot of uh, superpowers. In order to do these, in order to create these virtual worlds and simulate them and make them useful for us, there's a few things we need. One of which is, is rendering. Now, when we, most people think about rendering and 3D rendering, they think of it as largely a superficial thing um, you know, for, for uh, creating pretty images that you might put in movies or, or in your video games uh, that, that are pleasant for us and entertaining. Um, and that's, that's true. I mean, those things are really cool. That's where I've done plenty of that in, in the past. But if you think about what rendering actually is, it's a, it's a physics simulation of how the visible um, spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum um, how, how it interacts with matter in the, in the world. And so when we produce that image, we're simulating how a sensor of some sort receives that, that portion of the light field and, and try to reproduce the image as if, as if it was a real camera. This is extremely useful and necessary for us if we're going to create um, true digital twins of, of, of um, the the parts of the world that we care about so that we can simulate how sensors actually perceive the world and we can provide to the AIs that we are creating and training an accurate um, representation of that world or how they would perceive it once we move their brains from the virtual world into, into the real world robots with real world sensors. Um, the next thing we need in order to create a, a an accurate virtual world that, that's suitable for a digital twin is accurate physics simulation. The rules of the world have to match the real world out here. Um, we've been doing physics simulation in real time uh, for virtual worlds for quite a while, but we've been primarily doing them for, for video games where the goal is to entertain people, not necessarily to match the real world accurately uh, and in many cases, just enter ent to entertain people, you want to break the rules of real-world physics. You should have magic and superpowers and all that stuff. 
But um, for our purposes in, in the industrial world and for creating AIs that are gonna operate in the real world, we need to match exactly and or at least close enough so that so that we can trust what our AIs learn. And finally, um, we need AIs. If you're going to have a virtual world, it's not sufficient to just have it look right and have the rules of the wor world um, work correctly. We need to populate it with agents and things that are operating inside that. Some of those are going to be humans, but there's not enough of us actually to, to really populate these worlds. And we need these AIs inside these virtual worlds to help us build out the virtual worlds themselves. You can think of them as the construction workers in, in, inside, inside these virtual worlds. And so we're at, we're at this point now in, um, in uh, uh, development in computer science and computing um, and, and, and where we are in a society where these things have all converged. We have amazing rendering technologies. Our physics simulation has gotten to a point where it's fast enough and, and accurate enough so that we can start thinking about doing this stuff. And the last in the last 10 years, AI has been developing rapidly. So when we combine that with the types of supercomputing that's available to us today, um, the kinds of computers NVIDIA is building uh, that accelerate all of these specific things, rendering physics and AI, we now have the possibility of having real-time or super real-time virtual world simulations that can that can uh, unlock a whole bunch of stuff. Where it gets really interesting is when we connect these virtual worlds with the actual physical world. So in this example here, we, we have um, work we're doing with BMW. Uh, they spend billions of dollars on each of their factories, which are increasingly getting more and more complex and, and harder to design and, and convert from um, the world of, of bits in their plans into a world of atoms without, and have them function properly without delays and, and efficiently and all of that. Um, so, so what we do here is the first, we design, design these things that are gonna end up in the real world like a factory in the virtual world. And then we go build it in the physical world. And once it's there, we can augment this physical world with sensors, with controllers that control things like the robots and the conveyor belts and uh, all that sort of stuff. And we have humans inside the physical world that, that we can perceive. If we can gather all of this information from the physical world in real time and send it back to the virtual world and link them this way, we can have the virtual world become uh, a real time facsimile of the physical world at that moment in time. Inside this virtual, virtual world, we can then do a whole bunch of experiments and, and uh, start sending back control signals to modify the physical world. So what does this do for us? First, if you have such a digital twin and you have it at um, this, this level of accuracy and you have a way to, to go enter into that virtual world, either through you know, a window like your, the 2D screen I'm looking at right now or VR device or or um, eventually brain computer interface of some sort, we essentially get teleportation because you can go hop around to any part of this virtual world, just like we would in a video game, except that that virtual world is a reflection of what's happening in the real world at that moment in time. If you record the state of the world over time, you then get the ability to travel into the past. So in the case of that factory, if you record all of that state of everything happening inside the factory over long periods of time, you can not only teleport to any portion of that factory, but you can rewind to, to any point inside, uh, any point in time that you have recorded, which is an awesome superpower uh, that'll help you debug uh, uh, whatever went wrong in any part of your factory line. You can imagine using this for, uh, uh, Digital twins at any any scale. It could be for cities. It could be for um, uh, even microscopic sorts of things. If you have a simulator that can actually predict the future, or at least the near future, if it's accurate enough, understands the physics and the rules of the particular um, section of the world that you care about well enough, then then you get the potential of 
traveling into the future. So in the case of that Siemens energy thing I said, um, if we understand the physics and the, the designs of, of that plant well enough, we can potentially predict when a failure is about to happen. Uh, when we augment uh, our simulators with AI uh, technology, AI that can learn from the real world, we actually have the potential of doing this, these kinds of predictions. And so, so this kind of time travel into the future is obviously super powerful, but it becomes even more powerful when you start thinking about what you can do, uh, exploring many possible futures. We can take the current state of the, of the world in our digital twin and start varying the initial conditions. We can change the speeds and feeds of our factory, change the um, uh, programming of our, uh, our uh, robots and so on and so forth and explore many possible futures and choose the best one, the one that we like the most, now optimizing for, for all the things we want and, and, and go with that. Um, Moira, uh, am, I, am I running out of time? I, I don't have a clock here, so I can't tell. Uh, yes, yes, all right. wrap up, thank you. All right, Th these were sort of the main points. Um, I, I, just, I just wanted to, um, to wrap up with this. In order to build these kinds of simulators and power this future metaverse that's, that's useful for um, more than just entertaining us in uh, social interactions, uh, we need a whole bunch of new computing technologies. We need to, to have precision time systems that can deal with timing of things happening in the real world and synchronize them with stuff in the virtual world. We need computing not only inside our clouds and in the data centers, but we need supercomputing that's out at the edge, doing a lot of the heavy lifting in, right there at the edge where it's low latency and also can maintain privacy there. Uh, we need new kinds of simulation technology that can scale to these supercomputers and be distributed. Um, we're, we're working on a lot of those right now, but there's a lot more that's needed. And finally, we need all kinds of new AI technologies to help us build these worlds, to help us ingest the real world into the virtual world and, and to um, uh, help us uh, create all of the things that, that we need inside these new worlds, because unlike the early web, uh, where virtually anyone could create a web page, uh, as long as they had a text editor and could edit some HTML, building 3D worlds is a whole new thing. And only a small number of people on earth, maybe in the hundreds of thousands, really know how to do this, do this well. With that, I will, uh, I will end my talk here. Sorry if I, I went over time. Thank you very much. This was great. Thank you for also showing these concrete applications and really how you go about it. So we really appreciate your insights. We'll